Welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is an award-winning platform that helps our clients and community manage their financial crime risk exposure. We aim to democratize due diligence through our AI-powered AML and KYC platform, our expert research and insight into emerging financial crime threats, and our deep dive intelligence for enhanced due diligence. Find out more at wearethemis.com. Welcome back to our series of podcasts with Gavin Miller, a former detective with the Police Service Northern Ireland who worked in the Slavery Human Trafficking Unit there. Gavin was either the Senior Investigating Officer or Deputy Senior Investigating Officer for every successful prosecution under the new Modern Slavery Act within Northern Ireland today, so we really couldn't ask for a more knowledgeable person to be interviewing today. If you haven't already listened to the first podcast in this series, I really recommend you go back and have a listen now. As Gavin gives us some great insight into some of the cases that he worked on and helped to prosecute during his career. But today I'm going to be talking to Gavin about how important private public partnerships can be to anti slavery and trafficking efforts and what the private sector can do to add real value. So, Gavin, um, if we can leap straight into it, just how important is it for bodies to collaborate cross sector on efforts to tackle modern slavery and human trafficking? And are there any examples of cases that you've actually worked on that you could share with us? Sometimes success looks differently yeah so it's not always it's not always simply because I have got that conviction that that's successful and if I don't have a conviction I don't have success so there's a couple there's a couple of cases I would raise so not long before I retired I got a phone call and woken up at five o'clock in the morning because a large number of potential victims had walked into a rural police station in Northern Ireland, claiming that they were victims of labour exploitation. They had claimed that they had been forced to work in uh, a manufacturing industry and uh, they had not been paid, they had not been fed, and they were having to steal out-of-date food from bins for food. And they, they were in uh, a desperate predicament. And it was through their, the person who had recruited them for the, for the job uh, who was taking all their money and was treating them so poorly. So initially they get signed up into the National Referral Mechanism, which is the UK structure for identifying a potential victim and making sure that they're safeguarded and giving uh, food and accommodation and uh, other uh, other things that they'll need, uh, medical he- help or help with English language or, or, or whatever somebody needs, the, the care package will be put in place for them through the National Referral Mechanism. But they didn't want to make statements to police. They didn't want to make official statements to police. And they wanted to be repatriated back home. And if somebody wants to be repatriated back home, then that'll that'll always happen. So but it didn't mean that the case was over for us. So we worked with a charity in the, the destination country. So they met them at the airport and were there to safeguard them when they landed. We worked with the, the Gang Masters Licensing Authority and we went and spoke to the um, company that was employing them and they were completely, uh, uh, what was the word? They were, they, they were completely innocent. They had no idea that these people were being used and were being exploited and forced into labor. They had them, they gave them, uh, they paid them and the, the right conditions at their work, but they just didn't know that their money was then being forcibly taken from them once once they had been paid. But because it was brought to their attention, they, first of all, didn't use that recruitment company anymore, and then they changed their processes to make sure that it couldn't happen again. So when we're talking about transparency in the supply chain and what businesses can do to target harden themselves, that's a good example for me of a company that has been made aware of a potential risk and then they've put themselves an action plan and what they've put in place negates a future risk for them. So we we found that very positive. The, the suspects, they disappeared that day. The same day that the victims came forward, they disappeared out of the country and, and they flew away again to their home their home, initially home country. And then through the uh, NCA, the National Crime Agency, we liaised with that country and then shared information with them and they've started to conduct their own investigation into their behaviour. So they don't operate here anymore 
and we're hoping then to dismantle their criminal business to negate any further victims coming across. So we didn't get a conviction, but we put lots of things working with partners to safeguard people and safeguard future people and also hopefully safeguard that business from being involved in the future concerns. Another thing I would talk about is when you look at prevention and you're looking at your transparency and supply chain, it's not about you physically having to see the fruit of your labor every time. It's putting things in place which will maybe negate somebody being exploited in the first place or might bring benefit and safeguard somebody and you might never know about it. So one of the things that uh, I'm doing because I've since I've retired, I've missed being involved in this sphere of work so much. I'm uh, next month I'm planning to set up a, a kick, a community impact company, which is a social enterprise as a consultancy to look at human trafficking and supply chain to try and work with businesses and public bodies. As I've uh, never uh, looked at this line of business ever before, so the local council with me have been fantastic. They've given me some people who are advisors and helped me in how you how you set how you set this up. And one of the ladies that has been really helpful to me um, explained to me the last time I was speaking to her on her phone that her son was involved in law enforcement, and three years ago he remembered that he'd got a talk from myself, and he remembered the signs and the indicators. And he'd come across a potential victim at an airport. And because he'd had that training and it gave him the it gave him that gut feeling that something wasn't wrong. And then he could use the information and the training that he'd been given to go and find out a little bit more. And then he called the local police. And this young lady was taken from the airport and was put into the system and was safeguarded from where the, the flight that she was going on to. And I would never ever have known that. But it didn't matter that I didn't know that. The fact remains that you done did something that further down the path has hopefully led to somebody else being protected. Yeah, so, it's a ripple effect, isn't it? Yeah. When we talk about the value of partnership and collaboration, then uh, I was over in The Hague a couple of years ago and I signed uh, a, a legal document with the prosecution service to... Um, create a JIT, a joint investigation team. So that's when you're working with other countries' law enforcement agencies and you're working for a common crime type. So in this case, it was a human trafficking gang that was using and exploiting women in all three countries. So uh, we once we had formed the investigation team, it meant that we could share intelligence, we could share evidence from each other's jurisdictions and each other's court cases that we could make sure that there weren't parallel investigations and we were identifying which was the best jurisdiction to get the correct suspect for the the best outcome so then working with Europol and Eurojust and uh, formulating uh, coordinated days of action we did multiple arrests multiple searches uh, and uh, one of our partner countries they uh, they convicted 13 people. They seized hundreds of thousands of euros and they're all the largest, uh, their, their main suspect received a prison sentence of seven and a half years. So again, it showed the, the level, what well, shows that organised crime gangs don't look at jurisdictions. They try to use different country jurisdictions as a way to avoid detection, but it shows that there's the opportunity within law enforcement that you can you can work collaboratively together and doing that you can get successful outcomes for 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 everyone and it's part of that partnership where you're speaking to each other you're agreeing the on the crime that you're fighting with you're agreeing on the criminals that you want to target and you're agreeing with the partnership of what is the goals and how are you going to achieve those goals and, and you're open with each other and you're hold each other to account as well, but you're agreeing that you've got a common path and what you want to do. And it's not about trying to find just the glory has to be in your patch. It's about where do you get the best bang for your buck?
again, that can that easily moves into when you look at the preventative work and supply chains that you when you work at different tiers with different companies that are working in different jurisdictions again all it is about is building up that partnership building up that relationship of trust agreeing that you're all going to get outcomes that suits every partner in it mm. and working together for that common goal yeah and it's just as easy in business as it is in law enforcement and i'm sure in many ways it's even easier that's really interesting. I mean, it's so great, Gavin, getting these details from real cases that you've worked on because um, it shows, you know, we're really seeing the actual value uh, added in practice and not just in theory. So one of the major difficulties you have in law enforcement is um, when you look at modern slavery investigations, it's the complexity of them, the length of time it takes to complete a modern traffic investigation, in fact, the, the legislation has been written in the 2015 Modern Slavery Act that allows for victimless prosecutions where the victim will never engage. And if that is the case, then it can take a long and protracted length of time to try to build up all the evidential pillars that you would need to seek a successful prosecution. And that's where partnership comes into play. Uh, because you really need lots of people working together for the common good to try and get enough evidence to get it over the line. We, as, I, as I said before, we would have one of the largest human trafficking dedicated teams in the United Kingdom, and uh, we would have uh, we had had partners from the Department of Justice, Home Office, Immigration, who would also work within the team to share uh, share the workload and and share uh, knowledge. And it was important to have a really strong team because not only not all police forces in the United Kingdom have them, and when you have a human traffic investigation, the complexity is really, really high. But the numbers of investigations can be very small. So it means that for traffickers, it's a very risk-averse organised crime to be involved in because the number of successful prosecutions can be really low. The number of officers that are skilled if there's the right skill base to complete uh, the investigations are a low. So you've got a high complexity of operation and low number of officers that can complete it, low number of services that complete it. It means that it makes it a, a crime gang can use uh, human trafficking to make themselves vast amount of money. And it means that the likelihood that they get caught is... Uh, isn't that high. I'm not in any way trying to criticise the successful prosecutions and the hard work by really dedicated people that do up and down the country trying to catch these guys. But the fact remains, because of a number of fears where victims won't come forward, the complexity of the investigations, the, all the different evidence types that you need to build up to try and prove the case, it can be really hard to, to get that over the line. So if I was involved in drug dealing and I sell you a bag of drugs, then once we exchange, that's it, done. I've only made money once. Whereas if I sell you four or five people to use for labor exploitation, then every week or every month, I'll be getting money from you as you're exploiting those people. And the likelihood of victims being able to come forward can be slight. So that's why it's so vital that we have partnership. It's so vital that the Section 54 of Transparency Supply Chain exists because it allows and it requires businesses, other public bodies coming forward to look at their supply chain, to look to see how they can target harden and how by thinking about human trafficking, thinking about how to target harden their business, thinking about how to negate the risks that increases the knowledge that company employees are going to have, and that will therefore increase the amount of intelligence that can come forward when they see things that can cause them concern, and it means that they'll report more. And for human trafficking, our whole problem is the amount of intelligence that's out there. It's called the crime hidden in plain sight for a real reason, because it is, because of feelings of uh, isolation or use of language or indebtedness or immigration concerns, 
victims find it very hard to come forward and it could be real distrust of law enforcement. They've had a bad experience in another area and they won't trust you and traffickers will use that and exploit that and say that the police are corrupt and don't work with them because if you speak to them, I'll get to know about it. A, a number of years ago, uh, we were given a talk by uh, a couple of missionaries who had come back from uh, uh, some uh, Africa and China. And in our unit, we would always usually dress in plain clothes because you think it breaks down some barriers with victims and the, the uniform could possibly scare people. But the, uh, the, the, the couple who were giving us a talk, uh, they were saying that uh, it was Nigeria. Uh, they were in and they were saying that in Nigeria, it's full expectation that the police are going to be corrupt. But the clincher is going to be that if the police are in plain clothes. That that's automatically means that they're going to be corrupt and they'll take bribes. So with that knowledge, that would sometimes change how we would deal with things and how we would dress and how we would look to speak to potential victims to try and build up a level of trust. But it can be uh, it can be really hard uh, to fill up that intelligence gap. Uh, there's many there's many different ways that we get intelligence that comes into the system. So the fellow police officers will put in information. Uh, you maybe find that other colleagues and other police forces nationally or internationally can uh, give intelligence to help build that picture. Picture I talk about usually about a jigsaw and how to fill in the pieces to try and get the picture clearer so to understand what's going on. So uh, uh, other forces, the National Crime Agency can give information. There's a f fantastic charity on scene do work with the Modern Slavery Helpline number, and that's uh, fantastic for passing over intelligence to try and inform us of the landscape of potential human trafficking in the area. Or other colleagues, the Gang Master Licensing Authority, Home Office Immigration, Border Force. There's lots of other people who will feed in to try and help fill in that intelligence picture. But there's, without a shadow of a doubt, there's a huge potential for business to get involved as well. To setting that tone from the top, explaining what trafficking is, doing a lot more awareness raising and training within their businesses. So it gives their staff the confidence that if they think that there's something wrong, then they can report it. And part of that tone from the top is I don't like it to talk about whistleblower, which I always think potentially is it puts people off because it's saying you want to like make a complaint about your colleagues or your business. I don't know. It's about having the policy in place. If you've got a concern that you've got a risk, that you know what to do, who you contact, how you contact, and that you'll be supported. And what advice would you give to companies on embedding training and how it looks in practice? An example I sometimes think about would be in hotel industry. So if you're in the hotel industry and say you're front of staff, you're there to make their guests a time as enjoyable as possible and to uh, potentially kind of hide behind the scenes, but just make sure everything is perfect for, for the guests for their stay. But what happens if you see a guy book in a room with a number of young girls and you're seeing other males going up and down to that room all the time. You see them asking for more towels. You're speaking to the, the cleaner who cleaned the room in the morning and said that the room was filled with used condoms or lubricant or, or whatever. And it's covering this training and the awareness to know that potentially there's something maybe going on there and feeling that how do they report it and how will they be supported by their employers that they do report this. So that tone from the top and having that policy in place, how you can disclose, it is really, really important and can be a huge increase for us to try and fill that gap, that knowledge gap, the intelligence gap of that picture of what exploitation looks like in that region, in that area. So 
R- really important. So when you look at, uh, again, I'm mindful, th- this is for a podcast with famous financial institutions. So the things that I would say, if you're working at a financial institution, uh, then if you've got your your staff, your, your retail banking, are, are they trained? Are they aware of what human trafficking is? Would they know that if somebody comes in with multiple people talking over them, open up bank accounts, that that looks dodgy and how they report that? What's the mechanism for that? That people who are looking at suspicious activity reports, that they're mindful that they're looking at the money laundering and they're looking at the anti-terrorist, but they're also bearing in mind that human trafficking is there and if they can reinforce the training that is given to if they see something suspicious that then they they can re- report it all all those things are, are are really important and what i would urge i don't know if it happens in this industry or not but is, is it ever stress tested do, do you ever have secret shoppers that go in and try to open up an account where it's not correct do you do you ever have bogus accounts being opened up where it's there for people to identify, to see the policies that you are in place, are they robust? And if they're not, then you're sharing that. And it's just increasing. It's not saying everybody has to be perfect first time, but it's just saying, let's do that training and awareness and let's make it meaningful. So it's not just something that happens once a year that we're doing it. So it increases our skill base. I think it'd be really important for businesses to think about having business champions. That it's all well and good, the likes of me coming in and speaking to people or trying to help with training awareness or putting in a help with policies, but I'm not going to know the industry as well as somebody who works there. So, and there will be people in your business who are interested in this topic and want to make a difference to it. So it's identifying people who can be the champions champions in your business because they can take the modern slavery statement and the action plan they can see how it can progress and they can involve involve that and improve it and they'll be in a position where through newsletters or podcasts or whatever that they can keep this topic high on the agenda and it also increases the skill base of your employees who become the champions and at the same time as we talked about previously it helps that robustness of your industry it mitigates those risks it mitigates the risk for your reputation operational risks governance legal risks the risks of your customer all those risks are mitigated and you're doing things for the good as well it's it's a it's a no it's a no lose situation when you look at a, a commercial banking and it's not something that i know anything about at all but uh, I would say you've got great leverage and it's understanding the leverage that you have and how you can use that to, to make a difference, which countries that you're working with, how you can help with contracts and help with money flows, but there's requirements that you're going to require your suppliers and their tiers to, to look at. And when you're doing your due diligence and you find areas of concern, that you don't just go, well, I'll put the file in the filing cabinet and we just won't work with them. It's about how do I get that information across? How do I get that potential intelligence across, which could possibly use going ahead to save somebody from being exploited? Because it's there for the grace of whoever, that it could be any one of us. And as I keep on saying, it's such a gift that we have that we can make a positive difference to somebody else's life. And if you're in business, you have that great opportunity to do that at every level that you're working at. Because you also, because also, if it's really, it's a waste of time doing all those things for no reason, isn't it? If you're doing due diligence and not actually looking at it, and you're doing training that's just a tick box exercise, and people are engaging, you need to see it as an inefficient use of resource. Whereas if you're doing it with a proper purpose, then it's not. No. Yeah, exactly. I don't know how to kind of get it across, but. It's just that, you know, like businesses and you'll have your, you know, your annual reviews and you'll have your targets to do. And it just kind of feels in this area, the target is don't find anything. 
let's employ really expensive country companies to make really lovely, <laughs> lovely coloured brochures to say how nothing to see here. And it's just obvious there's something to see here. If you are a commercial bank and you are paying or giving money for a huge construction site, think of all the different tiers that are involved within that construction. If you're doing it in a different country, there might be concerns there where the supplies are coming from, the concerns with that. Construction would be seen as one of the higher risks industries. So if you're involved in a large construction project, there's no way you can physically say that there's no potential risks. It's just, it's just nonsense. And it's just accepting that I accept that's nonsense. But people are grown up to understand that there might well be potential risks. But rather than just de-risking it and dropping it, I'm working with the people, I'm working with the suppliers, I'm working down the tiers in a spirit of cooperation to try and let them understand where I'm coming from and help them get to the same level. It's it's all yeah, um, yeah, there isn't there isn't a drawback, is there? Not and not doing it is all bad. Mm-hmm. You know, I was saying about you know that what that person said about, you know, there's no there is no shame in finding. The shame is not doing anything about it. And when you you talk about it, it's like not just for Christmas. It's it's just that. It's not about, oh, it's coming up to the 1st of September. We need to do our modern slavery statement. Get the last one out the cupboard. Here's a few thousand pounds. Write something nice and shiny, and we'll throw it back in the cupboard afterwards. We've complied. One, morally, it's not a right thing to do. But for a pure business, it's not good business to do. That's not a good business strategy to do. If you're working with suppliers where potentially there's a risk of exploitation, you're putting you and your business at risk with that as well. It's not a sustainable business plan. You know, you want a level playing field. So what can financial institutions bring to the table in these partnerships, do you think? So I'd say things, I don't know, but things where people or financial institutions could maybe where they help and where they could help more is, is looking at the SAR process, looking at their money laundering uh, due diligence. With every human trafficking investigation, there's a parallel money laundering investigation with it because that's what it's about. It's about making money. That's all it's about. If you're a trafficker and you're making lots of money, you need a way to launder that money. You need a way. You need bank accounts. You need credit cards. You need debit cards. You've got your own lifestyle to consider as well. So anything that financial institutions can do to help target and identify that through the likes of red flag and different forms of famous search engines that are that worked at to try and identify potential suspects and potential victims, look at areas of concern, that that's all good. Uh, I've uh, been involved in the uh, a gymlet before, a uh, joint money laundering intelligence task force. Uh, and although we did not get a successful, successful prosecution out of the gymlet that we were involved in, the information that we got, the intelligence we got, and to help you get the totality of an organised crime gang's footprint uh, was fed into uh, the NCA, who, who took an investigation forward. So more gymlets, please. More SARS, please. The, there's uh, search engines that have been used successfully in sexual exploitation cases, looking at adult service websites in the past, and it's super that the financial side is is starting to to look at this uh, as well. So all those all those things, and the training and the awareness, and having that right tone from the top that this is something that is being supported and want to work at to improve together, will make a significant difference. It'll make a difference in what you find, but also the level of intelligence which you can then submit to help fill in that picture will be enormous. You'll be making a real difference. Oh, that's such a good takeaway. <laughs> what a perfect soundbite. And just before we sign off this episode, are there any final parting nuggets of wisdom or notes that you'd like to end on? I would like to acknowledge uh, three people who've made a real significant difference yeah. in the UK. 
for uh, looking at human trafficking and try to protect people here and target harden our country from exploitation. And the first is Theresa May. She yeah. brought in the legislation as Home Secretary and then took it forward as Prime Minister. Uh, she uh, introduced uh, a number of really significant pieces of legislation, uh, including Section 54, the Transparency and Supply Chain, uh, and also setting up the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner mm -hmm. position, which is which is vital. Uh, and uh, she also set up and gave money to uh, a modern slavery police transformation unit, and that was there, and they went around and identified best practice at a really early stage and shared that learning with other colleagues to make sure that we were all up to speed and tried to ensure that there was really good, robust investigations and increase their knowledge from an early start. Uh, a really significant piece of work and uh, really deserves a lot of credit in my eyes. I'd also acknowledge uh, Dame Sarah Thornton, who was the last independent anti-slavery commissioner. Uh, I, I met her on a number of occasions and she, she was a, a, a fantastic advocate for victims and held uh, power to account. And uh, Every year, the US do a report. It's called the TIP report, the Trafficking in Persons report. And every year, uh, the UK has been a tier one country, which is the highest level of operational effectiveness under the Pursuit, yeah. Prevent mm -hmm. and Prepare banners and how to safeguard victims and conduct mm -hmm. investigations. And one of the reasons that we are still there, the tier one, is that the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner and their staff are there holding people to account. Sometimes nobody likes to get their school their school work marked, but it's a really important thing to do. Uh, and uh, the the work that uh, Dame Sarah has done has been uh, fantastic, and I think should be uh, should be acknowledged. And then the last person I would ask to be credited was Kim Ann Williamson. Uh, Kim Ann, I've known for a large number of years, and she has worked in uh, government and also in academic. Uh, research and work in relation to human trafficking uh, and awareness raising and training in relation to it. And she is, uh, she's been at the forefront of a lot of work that is done in relation to Section 54. And uh, one of the reasons that we are where we are now, still at the top of the league table of countries, is down to some of the hard work that she and our colleagues do. Why does human trafficking exist? It, distress, it exists all over the world because people are displaced. They're displaced because of war or uh, social conflict or environmental reasons, uh, COVID, and people indebtedness has also created a spike that has, and Northern Ireland, Ireland is no different from any other country in the world where people are displacing to hear uh, because they're victims, because they're vulnerable. And uh, the number of victims that we have in Northern Ireland has increased uh, quite dramatically over the last couple of years, but so has the number of victims in the United Kingdom. So the trajectory is the same, but the type is very different. The type of victims is very different. So in the UK mainland, there's lots of children who claim that they're exploited and there's a lot of county lines criminality uh, where organised crime gangs use young people involved in their, uh, their drug dealing because they think that's a very effective and safe way of making money. We have not seen that as yet to the same extent in Northern Ireland. What we see is what very similar to the Republic of Ireland. And we see kind of 50-50 for labour and sexual exploitation. It's quite, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting piece in Northern Ireland because we're the only place left with a land border with an EU country. And there's been a significant increase in the level of trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland post-Brexit. It's been a, it's, on both sides, it's been a real large increase. And one of the things I would say is encourage companies that are based in the Republic of Ireland that operate 
in Northern Ireland, they should also think about looking at modern slavery statements and think about how they should look at their supply chains as well if they're if they're operating in Northern Ireland. There's no doubt organised crime gangs want to use a frictionless border to help them in their criminality because it is two different countries, it is two different jurisdictions. So trying to obtain evidence from one jurisdiction to get used in the other jurisdiction is time consuming and there's legal processes to go through. There's been a large increase in the number of roll-on, roll-off ferries since Brexit, which are coming into the Republic of Ireland. And people can easily use those ferries to come through into Northern Ireland and get ferries across to the UK. And there's absolutely no monitoring or control of them. And there's no doubt. And the same can vice versa can happen once who are coming over from the UK mainland, coming across into Northern Ireland and straight down into Dublin or Cork or or wherever. There, there's no doubt there's risks on on both sides. We work really closely with the Gardish. I keep on saying we do. It's we. I did. I'm retired now. I don't count anymore. But uh, we work very closely and still do, I'm sure, with the Garda Shia Connor. And there are task forces and uh, different committees and groups where everybody would meet and discuss how best to uh, deflect human trafficking within the island of Ireland. And really good, close working relationships. And we've done a number of operations uh, together. But there is no doubt that there is issues because it's different jurisdictions and because of Brexit. And I'm not trying to make a political point out of Brexit, but there, part of it was we left uh, and became a third party for some of the resources that you had within the EU. So there's a thing called the Schengen Information System which would alert cars and people and if they were flagged for concerns. We don't have access to that anymore, trying to get evidence uh, to be used in each other's jurisdiction. can be more time-consuming now. European arrest warrants that are not effective anymore in some countries can uh, say that they will not allow their own nationals to be tried in another country. Um, Getting access to criminal records, again, is another area which makes it tougher uh, to try and uh, keep everybody safe. Now, the UK government has a thing called the ICCC, the International Crime Coordination Centre, have put a huge amount of resources and hardworking, talented people who are working really hard and using Interpol rather than Europol. But there's no doubt where it's more suboptimal we're just not as good as we were before. And it's something that we're going to have to look at going forward and how to try and streamline working practices to try and make sure that we try to keep uh, our populations as safe as possible from human traffic. Oh, well, I think that's a really lovely note to end on. Thanks, Gavin. Um, really appreciate you joining us again. It's been another absolute pleasure to interview and listen to you today. And I really look forward to our next episode with you, which will be coming soon. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Themis Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more about Themis, please do contact us via our website at wearethemis.com or drop us an email at info at wearethemis.com. Thank you.